Driving on the platform, Professor so, Esther Miola Olawi, he is going to be giving us an official welcome address. Um, briefly, I would like to introduce Professor Esther Miola Olawi. Professor Esther Miola Olawi is the president of the Green Institute. He is a law professor at the Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar Foundation, Doha, Qatar. He's also the director of the OGIS. All Gas, Environment, Energy, and Sustainable Development at the Afe Babala University. It's our pleasure and our honor to have to have with us Professor S. Damilola Olawi, who will be welcoming us officially to this live event. Professor Damilola, um, you are on, sir. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. And... Um... It is my greatest pleasure um, on behalf of everyone at the Green Institute to welcome you all to this World Environment Day. Um, the Green Institute, um, ably led by Adenike Akishemolu and our team, have worked tirelessly to uh, bring us together today to celebrate and myself as the president of the Green Institute and other members of the distinguished board of the Institute, I um, have been fully satisfied with the efforts put together uh, to mark today's important milestone. The World Environment Day is an important initiative of the United Nations. It sets aside a day for the whole world to reflect upon the need to protect all aspects of the environment from degradation and pollution. As we know, the environment consists of water, air, land, plants, animals, humans, and other living organisms that make up the ecosystem. On the World Environment Day, we celebrate how far we have come in protecting these elements from human-made pollution, while also highlighting the challenges that remain. So today, we can liken it to the birthday of the, of the environment, an important day to celebrate our home. The environment is where we live. We cannot survive without the environment. So all of us have important roles to play in protecting our home. And that is why the many UN documents describe the environment as the common heritage of all humankind. Because without the environment, we cannot exist. Just as no one can survive outside of their own body, we all cannot live as humans or as uh, other elements of the ecosystem without the environment. The theme of this year's celebration is celebrate biodiversity. The aim is for the world to reflect upon how we can better protect rare plants, animals, and other biological forms that are currently facing extinction due to overexploitation, construction activities, mining activities, oil and gas production, and all those other things that have led to the depletion of rare plants, animals, and that have continued to alter our ecosystem. This year's theme is rather timely, considering the current challenges facing the world due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The world is witnessing a significant concern due to what I would describe as the altered interactions between the ecosystem and humankind. We've, over the last few months and years, we've seen the rise in zoonotic diseases, that is diseases that are transferred from unhealthy interactions between animals and humans. We've seen the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. We've seen SARS, we've seen avian flu, we've seen the Ebola viral disease, and now we are seeing the COVID-19 pandemic. The, the rise of zoonotic diseases shows that there is something wrong in our current use 
or interactions with animals and plants. And until we reverse those unhealthy interactions, the world may not be able to continue to survive and live life to fullest. Biodiversity is clear. It refers to the number, variety, and variability of living organisms. As the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, the CBD, defines it, it talks about the variability amongst living organisms, including terrestrial, marine, aquatic systems, and the ecological complexes. Simply put, we need every aspect of the ecosystem to survive. For example, most of the fruits and vegetables that we eat will not grow and survive without insects that pollinate them. So if those insects become extinct and destroyed due to industrial activities and construction projects, the world will be without insects and we will be without food. And without food, we will not be able to survive. So you will see what biodiversity means. It simply means the interactions between every single um, biological form that makes up the ecosystem. Our grandfathers will tell you that back in the days, they were able to cure different forms of diseases using plant extracts and without any need for medicine or doctors. Apart from those medicinal and recreational uses that biological species have roles to play in, they are also very important for historical, cultural, religious, and recreational purposes. We all therefore have important duties to ensure that our interactions with or use of all elements of the, of the ecosystem are sustainable. That is, international law tries to warn against overexploitation, tries to warn against depletion, and tries to warn against failure to comply with best practices. That is the fo uh, focus of this year's celebration. We have online a number of very important scholars, practitioners, who will help us understand some of these current problems and how we can address them. What today's event reminds us is that, number one, we are all part of a complex web or chain that is so interdependent. Everyone in the ecosystem, every member rather, every member or every part of the ecosystem is important. No one is better than the other. Humans are important. Insects are important. Plants are important. We are all interdependent. Any attempt to place humans above any other um, component is speciesism, that is, a form of discrimination against one species. And the result is what we are witnessing today. Every species is important. Number two that we should reflect upon today is that no, you do not have to be big, you do not have to be powerful, you do not have to be rich. Everyone has a role to play in protecting the environment. And that is what the Green Institute has shown us. The Green Institute is a self-driven initiative being propelled from, I would argue, one of the most remote or the, the remotest part of, of, of Nigeria, but still driven by ambition, driven by focus, driven by courage, and driven by a passion to protect the environment. So you do not have to wait until you're rich or until you're powerful or until you're the president before you can protect the environment. Everyone, just as everyone is important, everyone also has a role to play. I therefore, again, congratulate the, uh, I congratulate the Green Institute for this important initiative and for leading the way in bringing everyone together to reflect upon the lessons of today and to chart a new course, a sustainable course for the use of the environment. I welcome all speakers. I thank you for your interest in our activities. I thank you for uh, joining um, us today. And I wish everyone a wonderful, rewarding, and remarkable World Environment Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Damilola, for 
that warm welcome. We also appreciate your, your elaborate discussion into biodiversity conservation and for nature and the team for nature. So we would like to we would like to receive questions from our audience, at least just one. Those of us that have questions for Professor Damilola. But while we are waiting for these questions, I would like us to highlight certain points that Damilola, Professor Damilola emphasized on. He talked about specificism, that is um, favoring the human race against other species. We are all in this together and no one is too small to play a part in biodiversity conservation. You don't have to be rich, you don't have to be the president, you don't have to be high and mighty for you to play your own role in, bi in biodiversity conservation. So I would like to ask our audience if they have any question for Professor Olawi. While waiting, while waiting, uh, uh, Professor Olawi, I would like to ask you as, as a professor of law in the extractive industries where we acknowledge we acknowledge your work, we acknowledge your efforts towards nature conservation, even as a professor in the oil and gas. So we'd like to ask you on an individual level, how can we, how can we also work towards conserving biodiversity on a personal level? Since you've highlighted that we don't need to be high and mighty, we don't need to be rich, we don't need to become the president, but on an individual level, we also have a role to play. So, so if you don't mind, we would like you to share more light on that specific role that each of us can engage in to conserve biodiversity. Yes, thank you very much. That's a very good question. Um, I think whenever we think of the roles that we can play, we look at what the Green Institute is doing. Again, the Green Institute is not a government entity. It's not funded by the government or funded by anyone. It is driven by just one thing, which is ambition. Yeah. And that ambition is the ambition or the desire, the passion to promote conservation and ensure that everyone is aware of what it means to protect the environment, why we need to protect the environment, and how we can protect the environment. So I think if every one of us can have that same ambition and passion, with the world will be a better place. I also think we should remember that when we, have, um, when we go to the university or we go to school and we have a degree, the degree itself is not the end, yeah. is not what makes us, it's not what defines us. It's actually not even what makes us successful, really. Um, what those degrees are just meant to be stepping stone for a higher calling. So it's just meant to provide a foundation upon which you can then build. So when people say, oh, um, maybe because of the situation of the country, I don't even have a job and all of that, it is still missing the point that um, the, what we have now is enough to make a difference. Um, so I think we have to just integrate ecosystem concepts into everything that we are doing and the world will be a better place. For example, you mentioned I'm a lawyer, I'm a professor of law. What am I doing? Yeah. I could ask, one could easily say, well, law has nothing to do with ecosystem. I mean, you know, law has nothing to do with all of this, but yeah. that is not the approach I have taken. I've taken the approach of saying, I'm gonna use law as an instrument for um, asking the tough questions. And the tough questions are very clear. What does the law say about every activity? before you start a construction project or before you start any activity, what does the law say? The law says you should conduct an environmental impact assessment. And by so doing, you will be able to prevent pollution. You'll be able to prevent chasing away animals from their habitat. So my role is very simple. For any project that does not comply with the, required, uh, with, with the requirements of the law, it is my role to challenge it either in court or by through my articles or through my books 
to challenge those projects and highlight the dangers in moving ahead. So we all have big roles to play, and, and, and we, could, we could take this analysis to every sector. What about the universities? The universities have big roles to play in educating students, in creating a platform for them, like supporting environmental societies while in school so that they will learn these concepts. And, I, and, and you all know the Green Institute is doing a lot by taking environmental concepts to the universities, uh, establishing environmental clubs, um, so that students will be aware right from the beginning. Uh, and also universities, any university right now that is not teaching environmental law, or environmental science, or, you know, is, is not playing a part. And I, I would be very surprised if there, there, there is still any such university in, in Nigeria. I was, I was a student in the United States when I, you know, joined uh, what they called back then the Green Club, which was launched, um, you know, uh, by the former vice president of the United States, Al Gore, who came on campus to launch the Green Club. And that was my first involvement in green initiatives. And I've been involved since then. Again, the role of vice president Al Gore shows you what leaders can do as well, you know, in using their platform, government leaders at all levels, at local government, state, federal, can use their platform to support sustainability initiatives. I became, um, you know, interested in environmental law due to those activities of, of Vice President Al Gore, and you can see how far that that has gone. So, and I can go on. Even corporations, big corporations, very recently. HP, uh, the, the computer manufacturer, released a guideline saying any of their suppliers that does not protect the environment will be blacklisted. You know, if you do not follow green procurement, uh, green procurement practices, if you do not show us that you are conserving and protecting the environment, you will no longer be our supplier. Green procurement is the role of corporations to ensure and by emphasizing on green procurement, not only are they protecting the environment, they're also creating opportunities for recycling companies, opportunities for small, small and medium scale enterprises that um, do recycling or cleaning and all those things. So it's, it's a complex web, but I tell you, no one can say it is not my business. We, if we all want to protect the environment, we all have significant roles to play, whether as big companies or as small entities. Thank you very much for allowing me for your answer. We all have a role to play. So in the room here with us is Odunayo. So I would like to invite her for her question for Professor Olawi. Odunayo. Well, hello, Odunayo, Hi. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, welcome so, to the Professor green room. Lola, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much for um, the introduction. And uh, my question is on policy, government policy. And um, because for several years now, Green Institute have been doing this work in the grassroots, in universities, in secondary schools. And um, many other people are also playing their parts, like you said. But it would be so much faster to achieve what we want to achieve if we have policies in place to um, enforce um, sustainability and environmental unconsciousness in all of our citizens. And this is um, obviously lacking in Nigeria currently. So I want to ask that um, as a lawyer and um, an environmentalist yourself, what would be your advice? How can we um, advocate or uh, how can we advocate or demand that our government implement policy to make this work easier for people that are in need and um, to make the all our citizens to embrace environmental sustainability? Thank you. Thank you very much. You've touched on a very, um, you've touched on a very, very important um, topic. And the problem in many developing countries is that we still think of environmental protection as that 
fancy concept that oh we'll, we'll get to it when 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 we've settled all or solved all the other problems. Many developing countries will say, well, our people don't even have food; they don't even have jobs. You are talking of biodiversity or or environmental or, or, or environmental protection. But and 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 you know that thinking is reflected in everything we do, including in our policies, in which we we'll say, oh, you know, we we'll rather approve this project. You, you know, we want to create jobs. You are talking of environment, you know, cost benefit analysis and those sort of things, uh, which tend to sacrifice environmental goals at the altar of development. But I think that argument misses a big point, which is that environmental protection is an opportunity for growth itself. As a matter of fact, environmental protection is a big business all over the world. You know, um, I have talked about, uh, and ever since 2012, the United Nations has been emphasizing the green economy concept, which is that environmental protection should be seen as an economic opportunity rather than just, um, you know, like a feel good initiative alone. You know, green economy simply means we should integrate environmental protection into all aspects of development, into all policies relating to development. And I think that is what our policies are lacking. We still fail to realize that environmental protection is not a threat. It's an opportunity for growth. Um, we need to, and you see that um, if, when we begin to do that, then you'll see that government will create budget and financing for um, recycling, uh, for small and medium scale enterprises that are into waste management, um, and providing eco-solutions. Um, also, in many parts of the world, entities that are creating environmental awareness, such as the Green Institute, would have some, some, some funding, the opportunity to access some sort of national funding for, what, for the important job that the, that the Green Institute is doing. But failure to reflect that green economic concept is a reason why um, small and medium scale entities are not funded and they don't have access to now imagine if the green institute was funded or if you know if the if, if many of those small entities were funded to continue what they are doing imagine the number of jobs that would be created you know imagine so you're creating green jobs while also addressing environmental problems and the united states for example for me during president obama's uh, administration he appointed a special advisor on green jobs you know, in recognition of this green economic concept. Some countries have the minister responsible for green jobs, you know, recognizing that by integrating green solutions into the national uh, planning, not only are we addressing environmental problems, we are also actually solving economic problems. We are solving economic problems. We are solving health problems. Now, will many developing countries, including Nigeria, we do not have a minister for green jobs. And I don't think that is forthcoming. But even if we don't start that, you know, from, from that far, there is a need to begin to think of strategic appointments uh, and, and strategic policies that will integrate green concepts into wider planning and wider policies. And I think by so doing, we will be achieving environmental protection, social uh, improvements in terms of quality of life of people, as well as economic growth in terms of creating more jobs and creating opportunities for our people to escape poverty. Thank you very much, Professor Olawi. I hope, um, Odunaya, you've been, you've been clarified and you are content about his explanation. So without further ado, and due to our limited time, I would like to just take a question from the audience, from Claire, Claire Edwards. Claire Edwards is, is asking, she said, she said, are big corporations starting to get more on board with protecting the environment now? Are they changing their practices? Well, um, it's, it's a fantastic question. My, the, the truth is that we, we cannot deny the fact that we've made some progress. Um, we cannot deny the fact that corporations are now aware of the need to protect the environment. Again, many of these efforts 
have, have been intensified by by the United Nations, especially the appointment of John Professor John Rugi, uh, who, who who elaborated the role of big corporations in respecting and protecting human rights, including human rights relating to the environment. And since they released that uh, report and those recommendations, which which have been adopted by the United Nations and 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 well, um, you know. Uh, advertised all over the world uh, or promoted, you would see that there's been increased awareness by big corporations on, on the fact that they have important roles to play in integrating environmental protection into their operations. But I think in, in Nigeria, which I believe uh, the question, this question might be coming from, um, as well as in many countries really, there is there is a need to move beyond this philanthropic approach in which corporations think they are helping or they are just uh, giving a gift by protecting the environment. We need to move beyond those uh, philanthropic approach to a much more integrated um, and 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 um, you know I would say mandatory approach really um, because um, big corporations can be part of the solution. If we can fully harness them to be on board, you know, uh, but, but that's the problem we are seeing. We've been seeing how in many developing countries, corporations get away with activities that they will not be able to get away with in their own jurisdiction. You've seen big companies coming to Africa and, um, you know, undertaking activities that pollute the environment. And, and then when it comes to the limelight, they initiate philanthropic gestures. Um, you know, we've built a new hospital, or all those things to uh, sort of uh, palliatives. I think we need to move beyond that and integrate environmental protection into, you know, robust business management practices. Um, there is a lot of literature on the need for corporate reporting, sustainability reporting, showing. So as you report your financial gains and profit for the year, you should also report this is what we did to protect the environment. You know, and this is these are the efforts we are taking. A good a good example is the effort by HP that I mentioned, saying, henceforth we have integrated the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals into our practices, and anybody, any of our staff, employee, or or suppliers that does not align with the SDGs will be will be blacklisted. I think that's what we need to move towards, rather than this um, reactive approach or responsive approach. You know, whereby when there is a, a large large problem or cry, then we quickly do some feel-good initiatives. We need to move towards making sure that, uh, you know, um, environmental protection, SDGs, are seen as part of the corporate social responsibility mandatory one for, for entities. Uh, and there is a strong business case for doing that. Corporations will protect themselves from lawsuits that normally arise when they fail to protect the environment. Corporations Again, the, the, the increasing insistence by the, by the international community on corporate uh, responsibility for the environment shows that any, any responsible or smart board or organization will know that if we really want to remain in the good books of many customers, then we have to, and if we, if we want to avoid litigation, if we want to avoid uh, reputational damage, then we have to integrate environmental best practices into our entire corporate risk management framework. Wow. Thank you very much, Professor Olawi. And we really appreciate you. And we are honored to have you on this platform. And we thank you for all your, sustain sustain your sustainable efforts towards the environment and how you've, been, how you've been working towards achieving sustainable development in your own field, in the law, in the law field. So um, we've already exhausted our time and the speakers, other speakers and moderators are, are already coming in the room. So we'd like to appreciate you and we hope to see more of you in the future. And we also extend our regards to you and your loved ones. Thank you so much for allowing me. And it's nice having you here in the Green Thank you, Chipoke. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful session and I wish everyone a wonderful world environment day. Thank you so much, sir.